Okay, we are ready to get started. Thanks for bearing with us. Welcome to Decarbonizing Our Community, Community Navigating Local Building Energy Law Compliance. We're so thankful to Council Member uh, Lincoln Wrestler's office for putting this event together and having us here today. This event, during this event, you will hear from Simon Lugo, the Deputy Program Director of NYC Accelerator, and Rosie Tavares, the an Affordable Housing Specialist on NYC Accelerator. We have a wonderful agenda for you this morning. First, we will hear opening remarks from Council Member from District 33, Lincoln Ressler. Then we'll hear from Simon and Rosie, who will share about NYC Accelerator, talk to you about Local Law 97 compliance and how we can help you. Um, and then we will have a Q&A session at the end. So please do, if you're online, post your questions in the chat. If you are in person, there are note cards and pens on your seats so you can jot your questions down and we will have time for questions at the end. Um, and then at the, in the last 30 minutes of this event, we have slotted in some time for you to have smaller group conversations with our account managers to ask your building specific questions. So if you are interested in sticking around, um, we will drop a link in the chat for those who are, who are online. We will have to shift to a different Zoom link um, so we will be sharing that information um, <clears throat> once we get to that point in the agenda. If you are here with us in the room, we have tables set up in the back and you can head back to one of those tables to speak with one of our account managers in person. One final note before we get started on our agenda today, please note that this session is being recorded. We will be distributing the recording after the event. And without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Lincoln Ressler to deliver opening remarks. Thanks so much. It's good to see you all. Um, let me start with the most important things first. I just want to thank uh, folks who made this morning possible. Firstly, my staff, Tana, put an enormous amount of work into this event, helped create the idea for it track down the addresses of every big building in our district that was subject to Local Law 97. And so just want to thank Hannah for her hard work. I want to thank the library for hosting us. I have to say, this is the most gorgeous branch of a library that I've seen in New York City, um, period. And we're so lucky to have them for nice. I just want to thank Rachel and the whole BPL team. And of course, the folks at NYC Accelerator for their eagerness to partner with us on this event. Uh, I think we all understand the urgency of Local Law 97. Uh, because our buildings are, of course, the largest source of emissions in New York City, representing close to 70% of the emissions that uh, are generated in the five boroughs. And what Local Law 97 does is it tackles the most significant, you know, the worst offenders. Uh, big buildings represent that are subject to Local Law 97 represent about half, close small majority of the built of the emissions from buildings. And so if we can successfully drive down emissions from those big buildings, we can be the national leader in fighting back against climate change. And the goal here is to work with you, is to be good partners. And that's why we, we organize the forum today, is because we want to make sure that every possible financing incentive, every possible technical assistance resource is at your disposal. And I really want to thank the team at NYC Accelerator for bringing their resources to bear today. This will be a great overview of, of the resources and kind of the technical assistance that is available to you, but most importantly, a chance for you to ask questions one on one with experts so that you can start planning and get to work. Because we all want to drive down emissions in New York City. I know that is a collective goal. I know that folks are concerned about the requirements that are being imposed, but our office, and I know NYC Accelerator, is committed to trying to be a partner to make it as easy as possible to comply. Because the goal is compliance, it's not fines. The goal is not to be generating revenue here, the goal is to be driving down emissions. And so that means we need to work together to drive down emissions from large buildings across District 33, where we're lucky to have so many of the big buildings in Brooklyn concentrated here in our district, from downtown Brooklyn up to the Williamsburg Greenfront Waterfront. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
So without further ado, I really just want to thank you all for taking the time to be here, for your desire to learn and be good partners with us in our efforts to drive down emissions together. And truly, if there is anything that me and my team can do to be helpful, let us know. Um, if there are resources that you need access to, if there are strategies that you want to uh, explore together, if there are uh, policy changes that you want to uh, advocate for, let's work together. Our door is open. Uh, I think our goals are the same, which is to fight back against climate change and drive down emissions in New York City. And so let's make that happen. And without further ado, I'll pass it back to the Accelerator team. And thank you again for your partnership. Um, just want to say thank you to the council member and to echo um, one of the things that he said. The goal with Local Law 97 is not to generate revenue. It's really about uh, driving down emissions and uh, ensuring that uh, we secure New York's future and achieve our goal of uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, so that said, I will, during the next uh, couple of slides, I'll cover a little bit of the, what, the, what the New York City Accelerator Program is and then go into detail as far as uh, the Climate Mobilization Act and the various laws that impact buildings uh, throughout New York City. So that said, I'd like to start maybe by taking a step back uh, to frame why Local Law 97 is important. As the council member mentioned, uh, New York City emissions, uh, about 68% of our city emissions are from buildings. And by 2015, 90% of the existing buildings uh, will still be here and, and still be operational. Uh, so that said, I think it's really important to target buildings and really uh, tackle the amount of emissions uh, that are attributed to buildings in New York specifically uh, to be able to achieve our goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, and so in order to do this, uh, the city has passed a series of decarbonization policies, including the Climate Mobilization Act, which was passed in 2019, and also by funding programs such as the New York City Accelerator, uh, which provides free technical assistance and uh, provides assistance to any building who's looking to uh, comply with Local Law 97, as well as any, any other law that's covered under the Climate Mobilization Act. So you might be thinking, what is the New York City Accelerator? The Accelerator is a city-backed program that provides building stakeholders uh, with the ability to control costs, meet local law compliance, and boost their building's performance, and overall reduce carbon emissions uh, from the building sector. The way we do this is by providing free technical guidance uh, to the market to change how the buildings are operated, as well as how the buildings are built, uh, as well as providing assistance to identify building upgrade projects to help meet the emission limits established under the Climate Mobilization Act, as well as uh, ensuring compliance with the various uh, local laws. We also offer uh, free or no cost uh, building operator trainings uh, to ensure that the buildings are operated as efficiently as they could, and also to support uh, developing a green workforce uh, throughout New York City. We also connect building decision makers to service providers, so connecting you to contractors who can actually implement the measures that would enable you to reduce your, uh, your energy use. And lastly, we help by providing or facilitating access to financial incentives, uh, such as uh, the utility programs, as well as NYSERDA, uh, and also facilitating access to New York City PACE, uh, which is a property assess uh, clean energy, uh, which is a new financing mechanism that I will cover in more detail in subsequent slides. So how does the program work? Uh, the New York City Accelerator serves any building, any privately owned building, 5,000 square feet and above, uh, and this is new and existing as well. Uh, for smaller buildings, meaning buildings below 5,000 square feet, uh, we typically refer those to uh, one of our partner organizations, uh, in this case, uh, Center for New York City Neighborhoods, who specialize in uh, servicing and providing assistance to smaller buildings. In terms of how the program works, uh, you would get in contact with one of our, uh, through our various channels, whether it's calling our general program line or sending an email or filling out a contact form through the website. Uh, and at that point, you would be connected to an account manager who would serve as uh, your guide throughout your participation in the program. So the way the program is designed is you would have a single point of contact who would provide you with continuous assistance uh, to enable you to meet your goals. Um, and that person would, uh, would be your main point of interaction with the program. In terms of cost, uh, the services are free, as I mentioned at 
people on top of the presentation, the city back program. And so our services is offered to uh, any building or any stakeholder in New York at no cost. In terms of our typical uh, customer experience, uh, the illustration above just gives you sort of an overall uh, uh, from, from start to end in terms of what you can expect. Uh, however, I will mention that uh, it's it's really unique and the program is designed to be tailored to what your specific needs are. So in some cases, we have buildings who have reached out to the program um, and they have a contractor already lined up and they have a specific project in mind and they only need assistance with financing. In that case, they wouldn't necessarily go through the entire process, uh, but we would tailor their services to uh, to provide the assistance they need. Uh, but just in a, in a at a high level, uh, once you learn about the program, get connected to an account manager. The account manager would perform a building needs assessment, meaning they would try to identify what uh, specific needs your building has, any specific projects you're looking to pursue, and then together you would work to identify a list of measures or a list of projects that you would like to pursue. And the account manager would create a package of incentives. Uh, in order to reduce the upfront cost for you and identify any of the various local laws that would impact uh, your buildings and ensure that the projects you're pursuing will actually get you um, to the desired goal, which is compliance and also reducing uh, energy use within your building. Once you implement the measures, uh, we would then uh, connect you to service providers who can vet it and are able to perform this work. Uh, and once you install the measures, we would stay in touch and provide you with continuous assistance as needed. So if you'd like to uh, showcase or highlight what you've done in, in the form of a case study, uh, you'd be able to connect it, to be connected to an account manager who can support that, as well as if you'd like to pursue additional measures. So if you've performed lighting measures, uh, oil upgrades, and are now considering solar, uh, that's another way that we can, uh, we can work to support you. So just going into more detail as far as how the program works. Uh, step one, as I mentioned, you can contact the program through the general uh, phone line, as well as sending, sending an email to info at accelerator.nyc or filling out a contact form on our website. At that point, you would then be connected to a program coordinator. Uh, the coordinator's role is really to identify which account manager would be best suited to support your specific building. So the coordinator has access to a full suite of uh, account managers, some of which have specialties, whether it's affordable housing, financing, solar, or other measures. Um, and they would then, at that point make a decision on which account manager would best serve you. So once you're connected to an account manager, the account manager would go through an initial conversation to get a better understanding as to what, um, what needs your building has and what projects you're looking to pursue and would then begin through this working with you through this process of identifying what you can do to reduce your building's emissions uh, and, and also to reduce your operational costs. In terms of step two, uh, the account manager would collect data. So we do have uh, a lot of data that we've received from Department of Buildings and other city agencies on most privately owned buildings in New York. So your initial con contact with the account manager they would review that information and uh, just try to get some updated information from you in terms of uh, if the energy use has changed or if there's been a change of use in the building, and that would impact what recommendations that account manager would make. Uh, at that point, they would shift over to the analysis stage where we would determine prioritization of measures as well as providing with critical information as far as uh, laws that impact your building that have upcoming compliance dates, uh, as well as uh, identifying ways to uh, to improve your building's operations. So you would then work with the account manager to prioritize or identify a list of measures you would like to pursue. And at that point, uh, the account manager would then shift over to the impl implementation plan. So the implementation plan is really identifying the list of measures, identifying all the incentives to reduce your upfront costs, as well as financing if you have any need uh, as far as uh, getting financing to complete the project, and they would then facilitate access to the various programs. So we are in very close coordination and communication with the utilities, with NYSERDA as well, which, uh, as some of you might know, NYSERDA is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. 
They do have a number of programs uh, in terms of providing funding and grant funding for uh, energy studies, solar, and a variety of other measures. Uh, at that point, we can also uh, refer you to a list of qualified contractors, and these run the gamut. They, everything from solar uh, to boiler upgrades to lighting and any measure you would pursue, uh, there's a list of contractors to, to support you. Now that said, uh, I'd like to move into the Climate Mobilization Act and just learning a bit more about uh, the CMA, which is um, sort of the overarching uh, act that uh, has a number of different uh, local laws underneath it, local on A7 being the central piece of uh, the legislation. So in terms of local on A7, um, this law really impacts buildings 25,000 square feet and above. Uh, and sets emissions limits for this building starting in 2024. So as you can see in the graphic um, on the screen, in 2005, uh, that's sort of the base year that uh, Local Law 97 refers to. And so the goal is to get us to an 80% uh, reduction in carbon emissions from 2005 levels. Now I will say that this graphic is just for illustrative purposes. And so uh, this, the levels that are indicated there are not specific uh, metrics, rather it's more to convey the fact that over time, the emission limits uh, and the allowed emissions uh, from buildings particularly is uh, set to ratchet down over time. And so buildings will have to do more uh, in order to be in compliance because they would have a smaller limit in terms of what, what they can uh, emit as far as carbon emissions. So just to highlight at a high level, uh, market rate buildings, 25,000 square feet and above, uh, the first uh, emissions limits will be applied starting in 2024. Uh, and their first report is due in May 1st of 2025. And so 2024 uh, is the, the first year, meaning that that's the first year that their emissions will be tracked. And uh, in 2025, if their emissions exceeded um, those uh, limits that were set in 2024, then the building will be subject to, uh, to penalties. And in 2030, um, the emission limits drops. Uh, as you can see in the graphic, uh, the green bar indicates the, uh, the 2030 to 2034 limit. Uh, and so buildings will have to do more at that point um, in order to be compliance. And so one of the things that we recommend is that uh, instead of targeting 2024 uh, compliance, uh, I think it makes more sense to look beyond that and make investments that will ensure compliance over a longer period. Uh, in terms of affordable housing, uh, similar case, buildings 25,000 square feet and above, they have varying requirements uh, that are different from market rate buildings. And my colleague, uh, Rosie, will, will go in depth in that in, uh, in later slides. Uh, in terms of local law 33 and 95, you may have seen this uh, placard or this sticker uh, in uh, the lobby of uh, larger buildings. Um, so this was enacted as part of the Climate Mobilization Act and really requires buildings 25,000 square feet and above uh, to display their building energy rating. Uh, and this rating is very similar to what you have in restaurants. Um, the only difference being that, or one of the differences being that instead of indicating uh, sanitary conditions in the restaurant, this is really indicative of how the building is using energy. And so a B or an A is, you know, is, is a good indicator that the building is uh, running efficiently and anything below that is an indicator that there's, uh, there's some work to do. Um, and this, this rating system is really based on the Energy Star um, program. And so it's, it's really comparative in terms of uh, looking at how your building performs compared to a similar building of a similar size and a similar use as well. Uh, in terms of deadlines, um, May 1st is the deadline to submit your energy and water use. Uh, and October 1st is the deadline for uh, you know, placing your new uh, building energy efficiency rating label uh, in, in a uh, public uh, area in your building or in the, usually in the, in the entryway of the building. Uh, the other law I want to cover is Local Law 92 and 94, uh, and this law requires buildings to consider and install either solar PV or green roofs, and this is a requirement for all new construction as well as buildings that are 
uh, doing a major rehab or uh, update to their roof. So if you're updating the existing roof deck or implementing changes to the roof assembly, this law would apply and you would be required to, to uh, evaluate whether or not solar PV or green roofs be an option. Uh, for affordable housing buildings, they're subject to HBD's alternative compliance pathway until 2024. Uh, and uh, my colleague Rosie will, would cover um, the affordable house, housing section in, in more detail. Um, in terms of local law 96, uh, this was also passed under the Climate Mobilization Act, and this law established uh, the property assessed clean energy financing, which is a uh, voluntary financing mechanism that enables you to secure funding for your building, uh, building energy efficiency or water efficiency projects and repay them through uh, your property tax bill. So it's intended to provide you with a flexible financing option uh, for a variety of different projects. So in terms of the benefits of PACE, uh, it's long-term financing. Uh, it can go up to 25 to, th to 30 years. Uh, it's non-recourse, and uh, it really covers any energy efficiency or water uh, measures that would have a positive cash flow. And so, um, you know, working with the accelerator, we can help you identify which measures uh, would be eligible for the financing, as well as help connect you to uh, lenders who provide this, uh, this type of financing as well. Um, and one thing to highlight is that the PACE uh, loan is actually transferable upon sale, upon property sale. And so this really doesn't offer any, you know, add any limitations in terms of how you can use and operate your building. And PACE is, uh, can be retroactively um, applied. And so if you've completed any projects, any qualifying projects within the past uh, three years, uh, those can be rolled into, uh, into a, PACE, uh, a PACE loan. In terms of the requirements for PACE, uh, the first is an energy audit, either an ASHRAE level two or ASHRAE level three. Uh, and this is really to identify what measures uh, the building should implement uh, and establish what the savings potential is for each of those measures. Uh, the other requirement is a mortgage lender consent. So your existing lender would have to issue consent. Uh, and there is uh, standard forms that we provide uh, in order to secure that, uh, that consent. Uh, the third requirement is that projects will be required to have a savings to investment ratio of one or greater. Uh, meaning that the uh, the benefits of implementing these projects outweigh the cost of uh, not only installing the measures, but also financing the measures. So just to summarize, uh, I think I covered a number of different laws, but this, this slide gives you an overview of all the different laws that are covered under CMA or the Climate Mobilization Act. In addition to um, two laws that are covered um, under a separate uh, separate law, uh, which is benchmarking local law 84, as well as local law 87, which is energy audits and re retro commissioning. So in terms of benchmarking, buildings 25,000 square feet and above are required to uh, benchmark or indicate to the city uh, how much energy and water they use over the uh, previous calendar year. Uh, in terms of local law 87, buildings uh, 50,000 square feet and above are required to conduct an energy audit every 10 years, as well as to uh, implement retro commissioning to ensure that uh, the building is operating as design, as to the design intent. So in terms of uh, going into the compliance pathways, we're really looking at what compliance looks like for each of these laws. Uh, in terms of local on 87, Typically for market rate buildings, uh, the requirement is that you would have to uh, demonstrate that you are in compliance with the law, uh, meaning that your annual emissions are below the allowable limit set by the city. Um, and so for this reason, the GFA or the gross floor area is really critical because the both the limit and the penalties are impacted by um, by the gross uh, floor area. So. This is one thing that we advise um, participants in our program to take a look at is ensure that your, your building floor area is actually uh, correctly uh, being recorded by Department of Finance and Department of Building. Um, in terms of 
getting a sense of what your penalties would be or what they could be for your building. Uh, you can take a look at the uh, building energy exchange calculator uh, that has very minimal inputs. You would input your building address and you can get a sense of where your building stands in terms of the, uh, the penalties. Um, and in terms of how the penalty is calculated, it's uh, $268 uh, multiplied by the amount uh, by metric ton that you are over the, limit, the allowable limit. Um, and so, as you can see, it, it could really add up to a, a significant or substantial amount for, uh, for a building that's uh, considerably over their limit. So, one exception I'd uh, highlight in, in brief uh, detail is that for affordable housing buildings that have more than 35% run regulated units, um, there is uh, an alternative uh, compliance path. And uh, my colleague Rosie will cover uh, the affordable housing section in more detail in the later slide. In terms of compliance with Local Law 84, uh, as I mentioned, it's really based on the Energy Star system. So if you look at the table to the top right, uh, the column to your left indicates the, uh, the score, uh, and the column to the right uh, indicates the subsequent uh, letter grade. And so anything with any building that has a score of 85 and above uh, would be considered or would receive an uh, A letter grade. And anything uh, you know, greater than 70 but below 85 would be considered, uh, would receive a B letter grade. And so it's really important to uh, consider what the, what the impact is because these letter grades are in a publicly facing uh, portion of your building. And so they communicate to anyone going in and out of the building um, you know, how well your building is performing or, um, you know, the amount of work that still remains in terms of uh, reducing your emissions as well as your energy use. Um, over time, the process has become much easier. So the, to both utilities, both National Grid and uh, Con Edison offer a streamlined approach in terms of uh, being able to record your uh, energy use, whether it's gas uh, or electricity. and so. Once you connect with, uh, with their benchmarking teams, uh, they're able to upload this information directly to the Energy Star platform. So this saves you the time of you know, manually inputting all, the, all this information. Um, and this is a service that we, as, as the accelerator, can help you uh, connect with to streamline your, uh, your reporting as it relates to Local Law 84. And that said, I'll hand it over to my colleague Rosie to go into more detail on implementation of local on Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Simon. Um, my name is Rosie Tavares. I'm an affordable housing um, uh, specialist with the Accelerator team, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about implementation of local on 97 as well as delve into. Uh, how local law 97 affects affordable housing before passing it back to Simon. Okay, so first we're going to start with market rate buildings. So I think uh, we really want to cover how it is that buildings who are going to face fines in the coming years um, will show compliance. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, Simon noted uh, the first date of notice and importance uh, in terms of being in compliance with Local Law 97 is 2024. So for those worst performing buildings um, that will potentially face fines uh, during that first phase, uh, we would have uh, we would recommend that they implement energy efficiency measures by the year 2024 so that they can show that they're um, under their carbon limits by the uh, 2025. And the way that we, they would do that is they would file a local on 97 report uh, with benchmark energy data by uh, May 1st, 2025. Uh, and that would be certified by registered design professionals, including engineers and architects. Um, and uh, they would continue to do that uh, every May 1st year after year to make sure that they're under their uh, carbon uh, limit. I also wanna mention that um, 
kind of little talk about a little bit about how the penalties are calculated. So as Simon mentioned, um, the gross floor area is a determining factor as well as energy use. And that is determined through uh, the benchmarking analysis that they submit um, on a year basis, as well as the building classification. And you can see the visual here. We talk a little bit about the different um, occupancy classifications that are used to determine the penalty limits. Uh, but um, the thing of note um, that I want to point everyone's attention to is um, what Simon already covered, but how the carbon limits are um, calculated. So that's $268 per metric ton of carbon dioxide that the building is over limit, and that can accumulate very quickly. Uh, so again, we would really encourage any building that is looking, um, that is will face fines beginning in 2025 to start implementing those energy efficiency projects as soon as possible to be in compliance. Uh, Simon mentioned that there are some tools uh, for buildings to see where they are in terms of um, what year they may potentially face fines as well as how much uh, those fines might um, be in the future. So there's this uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions calculator through the Building Energy Exchange website. So it's a very intuitive tool, pretty easy to use. You just input your building. Um, and from there, this report is generated that speaks to uh, what phase of um, the fine um, years you'd be kind of um, looking to comply with Local 197. So for a lot of buildings that might not be 2024, but it probably would be 2030. And this speaks to not just a year, but how much potential fines uh, that building or your buildings in general will be facing. So it's a very useful tool uh, to get an idea of where you're at and start making some tangible steps as to how to be in compliance. So here's a little bit of an example of uh, what a building may look at in terms of fines, as well as some measures that will help uh, that building be in compliance. Uh, so for example, we have um, just a general example of a building 5605-55 Drive, um, it, with the building area of 56,700 square feet. Um, the, this building in particular, in this example, will be facing fines in 2024 if they do not diminish their um, energy use and carbon emissions. Um, and as you can see, by 2030, if those penalties aren't addressed, uh, they will continue to increase. Um, as opposed to other buildings, such as the two that are below, they don't face uh, fines in 2024 because they um, are not over the 2024 limits, but because with each five years, uh, the limits are going to become stricter and stricter. They will be liable uh, to face fines by 2030. So we really want to, again, um, motivate any buildings that are looking to uh, start doing work to do so as soon as possible and also look towards the future to make sure that uh, they're compliant with future uh, dates that will be stricter. But uh, I really want to pay a uh, I want everyone to focus on some of these measures that uh, will go a long way to make sure that the building is in compliance. So that includes um, installing solar PV or green or cool roofs, as well as lighting projects, updating heating systems, as well as cooling systems, installing controls and heating systems, upgrading the ventilation system, addressing any issues with domestic hot water, fortifying the building envelope, updating elevators, making sure the roof is in good condition, as well as addressing wall construction. And this not only helps uh, a building stay in compliance, but it also um, diminishes the building's operational cost and uh, creates some savings in that area. And here we just have a visual to speak to, um, to provide a guide of sorts for uh, different buildings, depending on how much over their limit they are. So for buildings that are pretty performing pretty well or close to their 2030 targets, uh, we would recommend some measures including investing in maintenance, installing low flow fixtures, air sealing buildings, heating uh, system upgrades, as well as uh, implementing lighting improvements in order to cross them over that threshold and um, make sure that they're in compliance and we anticipate that uh, implementing some of these measures could decrease our greenhouse gas emissions by 22 to 29%. For those buildings who are significantly underperforming, 
Uh, we would recommend that they do all the measures I just uh, mentioned, as well as take a look at the roof insulation and air sealing, replace heating system with more uh, efficient systems, uh, install heating system control and sensors, as well as separate their domestic hot water from heating systems. Um, and we anticipate that that could diminish uh, a building's greenhouse gas emissions by 29 to 48 percent. And again, help them avoid fines and incur some savings in terms of their energy use and utility bills. And lastly, for the worst performing buildings, so these are the buildings that would potentially or likely rather um, will face fines um, in the first phase in 2024. Um, we would recommend that they do everything I mentioned, including installing heat pump, hot water heaters, uh, looking into electrification generally, as well as upgrading old windows. And that uh, could incur uh, greenhouse gas reductions of 44 to 63%. All right, so I want to uh, briefly touch on the long-term energy plan. So this is something that is available to any building that is going through the New York City Accelerator who's looking to do um, some substantial work or any kind of energy efficiency work in general uh, to make their uh, building uh, more efficient. So basically what this report is, is we tabulate through your energy consumption as well as uh, including your heating, uh, your electric, and your water, and we take a look and create a plan as to what steps, or rather what tangible steps you can take in order to make your building more efficient. So that includes some, um, some notes on areas of opportunities to decrease your energy use in, um, in the form of energy efficiency projects. Um, that can include solar, electrification, um, uh, updating your heating system to a more efficient system. So. Um, this report is really helpful to create some, some really clear uh, steps forward as to how to make your building perform better in terms of its energy use um, in the coming years. Uh, so it's a useful tool and we're happy to connect you all if you're interested. I also want to talk about some available resources and programs. So uh, tangentially with all these uh, local laws and uh, with Local 197 specifically, um, advocating and enforcing energy efficiency across our buildings in New York City. Um, the utilities and other agencies have followed suit and created programs to help um, fund and incentivize and provide technical assistance uh, in, in order to uh, reach the implementation of these projects. So the utilities, Con Edison and National Grid, specifically for New York City, um, as well as PSENG, um, have multiple programs and resources available in the form of um, incentives and rebates uh, that really help uh, with the cost share of these uh, measures that I mentioned previously. Also, agencies uh, have programs available. For example, the Housing Preservation Development, HPD, has an electrification pilot, uh, a solar program, as well as a financing resource through the Green Housing Preservation Program that's available to buildings that are asset managed by HPD. Also, there's the New York State Energy Research Development Authority, NYSERDA, which has a multitude of programs to help um, with this goal of uh, carbon neutrality. So that includes technical assistance through studies, such as flexible technical assistance program, as well as the affordable multifamily energy efficiency program, which is also tied to the utilities and um, create uh, has created um, several incentives um, for a lot of the measures that we mentioned that would help a building stay in compliance. And for buildings that are interested in electrifying, there's also the Clean Carbon Planning and Retrofit Program, which creates guidance, technical assistance, as well as incentives in order for a building to electrify. And lastly, I want to talk about um, some other financing options. So um, as uh, Simon mentioned, there's uh, PACE, the Commercial Property Assessed Energy um, financing uh, model, which is available to buildings who would like to finance their energy efficiency projects, as well as traditional financing uh, products that we can connect you to um, as you uh, connect with account managers and try to uh, find out how you can fund all these projects. All right, so I'm going to dive into Local Law 97 and how affordable housing fits into compliance. So um, as Simon mentioned, buildings over 25,000 square feet, uh, or most rather, um, are going to be um, liable to comply with Local 197. 
But what I want to point everyone's attention to is the last bullet, Article 321, which establishes alternate pathways for certain types of affordable housing uh, to be compliant in the coming years. So it's an alternate pathway um, that's available to affordable housing uh, so that they can uh, diminish their energy consumption, but again, paying attention to their specific circumstance as a demographic of buildings. So first I wanna cover what is designated as affordable housing under Local 197. Uh, so first and foremost, um, if your asset managed by an agency, so the whole alphabet soup of acronyms, HPD, HUD, um, HCR, um, you were, are likely designated as affordable housing. So that's something that we always wanna that's kind of one of the first conversations we have with buildings when they're trying to identify whether they um, are uh, considered affordable housing under Local Law 97. Something else to look at is if 35% or more of your units are rent regulated, you're also um, considered affordable housing under Local Law 97, as well as any buildings with HUD project-based assistance, such as Section 8, Section 202, um, anything that's considered afford, uh, supportive housing um, is usually considered affordable housing as well, um, which will then allow them to uh, go through this alternative path to comply with Local Law 97. And the paths are twofold. First and foremost is the 2030 pathway. So this is basically for buildings that are already performing pretty well. So um, if you've identified that your building is already close to the 2030, um, their 2030 greenhouse gas emissions threshold, we would recommend that they just implement a few energy efficiency measures to um, cross them over that line, and then they'd be um, good to go for the rest of the decade. For buildings that are affordable housing um, under the designation that I just mentioned, um, but aren't performing close to their 2030 limit, we would recommend that they go through the prescriptive energy conservation measures pathway. This pathway um, is basically a list of 13 measures uh, that if an affordable housing um, uh, building that's been designated. So if they implement these 13 measures, they would be considered compliant uh, uh, through 2030. So if they uh, implement um, all of these 13 measures by 2024 and have a report created by a retro commissioning agent, uh, they're all set for the rest of the decade. So I want to talk through this list and talk about what these 13 measures are. So broadly, there's some heating and hot uh, water system repairs and upgrades, including adjusting temperature set points for heat and hot water, repairing all heating system leaks, maintaining heating systems, installing individual temperature controls or insulated radiator enclosure with temperature controls, installing radiant barriers behind all radiators, insulating all pipes for heating and, and or hot water, installing indoor and outdoor heating system sensors and boiler uh, controls, and for steam buildings specifically, um, this uh, pathway requires them to insulate steam system, condensing tank, and water tank, replace and repair all steam traps, as well as uh, install or upgrade steam system master venting. Uh, buildings would also have to upgrade common area lighting to LEDs, as well as weather eyes and air seal walls, windows, doors, and ductwork. And lastly, install timers or sensors on local exhaust fans. So um, for anyone who um, isn't sure which pathway is right for them, um, again, at the accelerator, we're more than happy to walk you through that um, and recommend what pathway is most feasible to you. Um, and there's also some things that we wanna kind of advocate for you to look at. So for any building that's over 50,000 square feet, um, we would want them to take a look at their uh, past energy audits to see where there's points of opportunities in terms of energy efficiency. We would also recommend looking at local audit for uh, benchmarking data, as that will tell you if you're close to your 2030 uh, limit and, and help you uh, make a decision as to which pathway is best for you. And lastly, we would uh, really recommend um, taking a look and thinking about your long-term capital plans in order to um, start making some tangible plans as to how, um, um, how and when you're going to be able to start um, putting in the efforts and, and start doing these projects to make sure uh, you're in compliance. And 
this, uh, we already covered, but basically, again, um, if you're close to your 2030 targets based on looking at your uh, benchmarking data, these are some measures that you can implement in order to uh, cross that threshold and be in compliance. Um, but these are all measures, again, that are um, that will go a long way in reducing greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions and make sure that the building is in compliance. And a lot of these are incentivized specifically for affordable housing through uh, um, the agency uh, and the utility programs that I uh, touched on briefly. But um, I'm going to pass it over to Simon now. Uh, and thank you all for your time. And I look forward to talking to you all after the breakout. Thanks, Rosie. Um, so in this next section, uh, which is the final section on this slide deck, just like to cover the New York, uh, New York City Carbon Challenge. Uh, if you're not familiar with the program, this program was launched in 2007 by the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Uh, the program is really a voluntary uh, recognition program uh, that has participants who have committed to uh, taking a voluntary commitment to reduce their emissions 30% um, over a 10-year period. So this graphic just indicates sort of the timeline of how the program has developed and evolved over time. Uh, so starting in 20, 2007, it initially launched with a uh, challenge for universities. And a number of the large universities throughout the city signed on to the challenge and took the pledge. And actually a number of uh, the participants have already achieved that 30% uh, reduction. So over time, a number of different uh, other sectors were added. Uh, for hospitals, commercial buildings, multifamily, hotels, and uh, retail as well. Um, one other major update that I would like to highlight is um, in 2021, uh, the program launched the Carbon Neutrality by 2030 Challenge, uh, which is really geared towards, as the name suggests, uh, achieving carbon neutrality by 2030. So we currently have about 13 participants who've uh, taken that pledge. Uh, and are making progress uh, towards achieving that goal. In terms of the benefits of uh, participating in the um, in the carbon challenge, uh, the first is really first and foremost uh, uh, promotion and recognition. Uh, this is a really prominent program uh, that is uh, you know being promoted on the mayor's uh, mayor's website as well as, well as on the uh, New York City Accelerator uh, website. Uh, but beyond that, I think it communicates to the marketplace that your organization or your building has made a, a strong commitment to uh, fighting climate change and that we, you've made a, a, pub, a public commitment to uh, continuously improve on how your building uh, operates over time. Um, and the other benefit is participating in a platform for uh, peer exchange. So as I mentioned, there are a number of different organizations who are committed and are part of the carbon challenge. And so this program gives you the opportunity to learn from each other and have that peer-to-peer -peer engagement uh, where they share best practices and, and different strategies that they utilize to achieve their, uh, their reductions uh, and really highlight new technologies and things that they've implemented or come across that can help your organization or your building more specifically. Uh, you would also get access to tools and resources uh, as, as mentioned earlier, the accelerator is able to help you with long-term planning. Um, and so if you're looking at planning your capital budget for uh, either an, an, a portfolio of buildings or even a single building, uh, you would have access to that, uh, to those resources. In addition to that, we would help you with, uh, you know, tracking your greenhouse gas inventory. Um, so being able to report back um, as far as the progress that you're making uh, towards achieving your uh, your committed goals. And the other uh, benefit is really accessing uh, free technical assistance through the accelerator. Uh, so this can help you identify incentive programs that could cover some of the projects or measures that you're working on, uh, as well as identifying financing opportunities for, um, for your building. In terms of uh, taking the pledge, uh, the first step is really to submit a participation letter uh, and this would have to be signed with um, someone that has signatory authority within your organization or uh, in your building. Uh, and it's really just a, a letter, a non-binding, uh, non non-legally binding letter 
uh, that commits to a specific reduction goal that you've set as an organization or as a, as a building. And so we can help uh, with that process in terms of identifying what, what goal to shoot for, but uh, ideally would like that to be um, to be done by the participant to set um, set a goal for themselves and, and we can help them achieve that goal. Um, the other thing that the letter would state is the base year. Um, so your reductions are tracked, uh, but you have the flexibility of determining what base year uh, would be most representative of how your building typically operates. Um, and with that, you would submit the, uh, the sign letter um, to the city and we would um, you know, review your application. And once you're accepted into the program, uh, participants will be required to attend uh, or at least have someone from their organization attend uh, quarterly meetings uh, where we have knowledge share and, and a, diff a variety of different resources that we uh, we provide to the participants. Another requirement is on an annual basis, you would have to provide an inventory of your greenhouse gas emissions. So just indicating over the previous calendar year how much energy uh, you're building use, whether it's uh, fuel, electricity, or natural gas. Um, and then uh, we would indicate sort of what progress you've made towards your goal. And uh, we would communicate back to you in terms of uh, how close you are to your target and uh, continue, you know, providing you with assistance in terms of um, either financing resources, incentives, and other things that uh, can help you along your, your journey towards um, your reduction goals. So if you're interested in the program, uh, I invite you to visit the website, that's nyc.gov forward slash carbon challenge. Uh, you can also reach out uh, to our general email, which is carbonchallenge at cityhall.nyc.gov. And before we jump into the questions, I'd just like to, you know, to offer some closing statements. Um, I think we've covered a number of different local laws uh, offered a number of different resources in terms of incentives and financing. Uh, but overall, I think the goal is not necessarily to make you experts in the local laws or the different resources, but to communicate that there are different resources and there are a variety of different local laws that may or may not impact your building, and that the accelerator is there to help you identify which of those laws impact your buildings and what is the best way for you as a building or you as an individual uh, to comply with those local laws. And with that, I think we can open the floor uh, for questions. And Natasha, I think I'll hand it over to you to see if there are any questions <laughs> that come in through the chat. Yeah. I'm just... Okay, there's a second microphone if you need it. Yes, we have a quiet crew this morning. <laughs> um, we actually did not receive any questions online, surprisingly. Do you have any questions? In the yeah. Is the accelerator getting Here. funding from the federal bill? Hang, hang on. Let's... Uh, yeah, so Sorry. we are. Is the uh, NYC accelerator getting money from the new federal bill? No, not not at this time. I think um, perhaps things could change over the next um, couple of weeks or months, but at this time we're not receiving any money. Please speak more on the electrification pilot from HPD. Yeah, so again, that is a pilot that's available to properties that are asset managed by HPD. Uh, I would encourage you to visit their uh, preservation financing page. Um, also, they are having a, um, a presentation tomorrow that talks about that pilot as well as the following week. So I'm happy to include that in the chat. Um, when I get a chance, it's an event, event bright page, but it kind of speaks to a little more details of that program, but, um, and it connects it to the specific folks that are leading that project, but it's something that is available to HPD uh, buildings, so I would definitely recommend looking into it, and I'll make sure to put some more information in the chat so you can look into it. One of the biggest challenges to this program is the financing and the public sector is stepping up to different degrees. Uh, the Con Ed 
program uh, got limited fairly large uh, in terms of its reduction. And are you seeing anything coming from the private sector in terms of ESG and other sources like that? And is that also being facilitated through the accelerator? Yeah, so through the accelerator, we do have um, a portal for lenders to offer products that could either, you know, serve our the demographic that we work with. So privately owned buildings looking to implement energy efficiency and gas, uh, gas efficiency and water efficiency projects. Um, so we do have a list of vendors who are, um, you know, offer products that, that could serve that market. Um, but I think you, you're referring to a more specific case. Uh, I, I, I'm looking at environmental social governance uh, companies that are focused on providing funding for sustainable projects, and that's through the private sector of actually direct money. This is not the vendors, these are the investors that are providing funds. Yeah, I don't think we've seen any um, any direct, you know, indication from, from the market that there's um, products or investors who can um, direct that funding through the accelerator. I think the only way we can gauge is through uh, actual lenders uh, and also through, I would say, through the carbon challenge, you know, a number of the participants have their own internal ESG goals, and those are the drivers that are, uh, you know, compelling them to engage with the program and, and to make these commitments. But it's really using leveraging their internal funds to complete projects that benefit them directly rather than um, you know offering investments to to help a broader uh, segment. Morning, thank you for uh, the presentation. Um, Local Law 84 is due at de December 31st of your 10 year period based on the building code of technical. What's the process and what's the criteria for an extension? Because I've understood from some people that I've talked to that you need a full year of heating and cooling data to do a good job on the Outlaw 84. So, how does the city approve an extension and when did that need to be submitted? By? Yeah, I think um, in terms of the deadline, May 1st is a deadline to submit the report, and but it, the, the energy use would cover the full can, calendar year, so from January through December, um, but May 1st is the actual deadline to submit that, um, that information. Maybe I said the wrong thing. The report is due every 10 years, it's due on December 31st year. Yeah, so the local law 87. That's 87. I yeah. That's 87. Yeah, so 87, I think, um, in terms of the extensions, I think the, I, I'm not aware of any specific uh, rulemaking that DOB has issued in terms of what criteria they use to um, to provide extensions. I think it's more on a case-by-case -case basis where you would have to contact DOB directly. Um, but yes, I, I think in terms of the, um, in terms of the law, it's every 10 years that you would have to perform an energy audit uh, as well as retro commissioning. Um, and so, you know, if there are, you know, situations that limit your ability to do that, I, I imagine DOD would have, um, you know, a, a protocol or a way of evaluating, um, you know, the authenticity of that request. Um, but yeah, I would, you know, instead of speaking out of turn, I would I'd recommend that uh, maybe you check with DOD. And if you'd like to funnel that question through the accelerator, we're more than happy to, to help follow up. Thank you. So we did have a couple of questions come in online. Um, one question is if the recording and presentation will be shared. Yes, yes, it will, of course. Uh, we always do that. It will be added to the NYC Accelerator YouTube page and we will circulate that link um, by the end of this week. And then uh, we had a question online. Is there a standard vetting process for contractors that NYC Accelerator recommends? Yes, um, so the accelerator actually has a list of service providers um, where we have our own vetting process. Um, but typically, I'd say, you know, if you're choosing to use a contractor who's not on our list, uh, one thing I would recommend is looking at um, either the utility programs or the state programs through NYSERDA to ensure that the vendor is on those lists because they typically have um, certain requirements in terms of years of service and 
um, you know, the insurance and, and other other metrics. So at least you're having a, a, a different uh, an, an external uh, independent observer uh, sort of doing the vetting instead of relying on, you know, creating your own uh, metrics in terms of how to vet them. But that's the one recommendation I would make. And I would add that, um, you know, if you speak to one of our account managers, we do have a service provider list that we've uh, done some additional curating and, and vetting uh, to ensure that they are able to perform the work that they're uh, they're marketing. So um, that would also be another safe bet is, is relying on our list or relying on the intelligence list as well. Any other questions in the room before I take another online question? Okay. And you can feel free to use your note cards. You can write down questions. Thank you. So this might be a pretty quick question, and maybe you covered it, but I want to make sure I understand. So from the, the structure of, of the fines that will begin in, in 2025, let's say hypothetically your building's not in code in 2025 and you receive that fine. When is the submission date to avoid that fine in 2026 going forward? Is it is it uh, December 31st or is it the next following May? Uh, I think that's specific to local law 87 or 97? 97, yes. Yeah. Um, I think May 1st of every subsequent year. Is that starting May 1st? Yeah. Okay, thank you. You were talking about the uh, vendors list. Where can we find that list? Contractors. Yeah, great question. It's on our website, um, NYC. Uh, it's accelerator.nyc slash contractor. Great. Quick way to get there. <laughs> In our apartment building, there's many PTACs, which are very energy inefficient. Do you have a recommendation list on your website or as a city with regards to? Heat pump and the efficiency due to the Energy Star ratings. I went to the Energy Star stuff and pretty broad list, but is there any best known methods or practices that you've learned on best ways to replace heat tax and get the energy efficiency that you need? Yeah, I think one one new um uh, I guess technology option is to convert the P tax to um, heat pumps. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's probably the most um, efficient, especially taking into account local on 97. Do you have a uh, list of those pumps? Uh, we don't have a list of the actual equipment, but we do have a list of vendors who can uh, maybe make that recommendation and determine which ones would be best suited for your building. Okay. Oh, yeah, we are also hosting, uh, NYC Accelerator is hosting a webinar next week to um, a week from uh, tomorrow on the 29th. Um, we can share that information around. We are going to be hearing from manufacturers who um, make packaged terminal electric and heating technology. So the idea is to create those connections in the market. So feel free to join us next Thursday. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm an account manager uh, for Nick State Accelerator. So the question about Local 97, about when to complete these measures, would be by end of, uh, of the calendar year. Okay. So, okay. And okay. Exactly. so May 1st is when you report it and submit the certification, but for that uh, previous calendar year, that is. Yeah, okay. so those fines, fine of 2025, I until that end of 2025. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. I know the heat pump is the right way to go. 
you're not finding the right sleeve, you've got a combination of eating and cooling, you're worried about humidity and condensation. It's kind of a lot of you can't get a stick of water in the sewer line is the problem. So there's many attributes on the PCAC inflation that we're trying to determine. So a great that's question. Method from people in the room was great. It's a great question. So what we're going to do is region uh, direct and help uh, our, uh, our clients. We call you guys our clients in regard to let's say finding out now speaking to an engineering um, consultant and they would we took the recommend to flex tech I sort of flex tech consultants at all. And then you can uh, you speak to an account manager. Um sorry um you can do a direct you can get your own information resources as well. Uh, as for the service providers speak to account manager at home we'll help sort the list of New York City accelerator uh, providers and at the same time figure out what you're trying to do and see if you're building qualified for incentive programs and see if the projects that you're planning to implement qualifies for rebates as well and more. So it'd be great to always reach out to us. Stick around after, but we'll have time at the end to talk to one of one of our account managers. I wanted to add one thing, um, adding on to what Sam said. Um, there's a great program through NYSERDA called Low Carbon Pathways, um, which is actually a study. Uh, it's an electrification feasibility study. Um, and uh, in some cases, they cover up to 75% of the cost of the study. So that might be something that Sam or one of the account managers can help you look into. And we'll give you a direct pathway as to uh, what's the best technology to convert to. Uh, my question is uh, regarding rent stabilized affordable housing buildings. So to achieve the New York City goal, um, half of the buildings are uh, affordable housing building in, in multifamily sector. Um, I know there is a prescriptive list of actions that need to be taken, but the ultimate goal for carbon neutrality would be electrification. Uh, is there any plan maybe in 2030 that will require these buildings to move away from fossil fuel? Because these prescriptive lists doesn't really say anything about moving in that direction. Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, and in terms of the prescriptive list, that is um, uh, a pathway that is only intended for the end of the uh, decade, so until 2030. So we're anticipating that by 2030, uh, there's going to be a shift and there's going to be new guidance as well as new programs available to really kind of push us through uh, electrification, which is basically the goal for most buildings so that we can be carbon neutral and hit our goals. But I can mention that there are a ton of new programs already coming through in terms of electrification. There is actually uh, one that came through uh, with uh, CPC um, that is uh, funding hundreds it's it's looking for buildings, um, and I believe it starts in December. But it's a multi-million dollar program that is completely uh, geared towards helping affordable housing uh, get electrification um, through. So a ton is coming online, and as well, NYSERDA has some programs available. But we're hoping to see more and for there to be more funding so that uh, affordable housing as well as the whole building stock can move towards electrification. That's what needs to happen. Um, sorry, I have two questions. And the one is, how are you all thinking about, uh, you know, whether or not to encourage the purchase of renewable energy credits for compliance? And then second question is, are you all doing any work around sort of the tenant engagement side of the question and how to get individual unit residents to reduce their own energy use, whether that's a capital upgrade or some behavioral? Yeah, I think in terms of the renewable energy credit question, I think that's um, every it, it's different for each uh, each building. So I think in some cases there are buildings that have certain limitations that uh, with making upgrades in their building alone that wouldn't necessarily get them to uh, below the threshold of, to achieve the goals that they intend to achieve. So I think in that case, uh, rights become you know very important in terms of. Uh, their strategy for local law 97 compliance. Uh, but in other buildings, I think it's it's important to look at what they can do and then add, always consider Rex as sort of a, a secondary uh, option. Um, but it's always good to, to look at what you can do first and then if there's any balance or any, any uh, you know, 
uh, delta between where you need to be, then uh, Rex at that point will become um, become feasible. And I think the other thing is with Rex uh, in New York City specifically, in terms of local on 97, those Rex would have to be sourced from uh, projects you know within load zone J. Uh, and as as we know, you know, there's a very limited amount of projects uh, happening in New York that could you know sell Rex um, to other other users. So I think. It's more of a supply and demand issue, but also in terms of strategy, it's it's more of a you know think about what you can do first and then uh, rights be covered. And I'm sorry, I didn't catch uh, your second. Yeah, I think time and engagement. So throughout the presentation, I've, I've referred to building stakeholders uh, being you know very intentionally talking about uh, renters, tenants, uh, you know anyone who has an affiliation to a specific building. So it's part of what we do, and, and we get a lot of inquiries from build, from building tenants who are, you know, looking to uh, help out their building or just uh, serve in a certain capacity in their building, whether it's in a green committee. And so we do have a lot of engagement with them, and we provide education around the long seven. We provide access to our events, uh, and also we provide uh, uh, recognition through our recognition platform. So if you are a tenant or a renter and you'd like to, uh, you know, sort of engage your building and compel them to work with the accelerator and, and, and do projects, we would recognize you for your efforts through the accelerator as a, as a partner or as, as someone who's uh, moving the needle in terms of um, sustainability. We have time for probably two or three more questions. Um, one question that came in online is from Larry. He said, I know my building's greenhouse gas emissions and metrics in metric tons, but how do I figure out the 6.75 per square foot limit for residential? <laughs> that, I mean, to me, honestly, that, that seems like a very specific question and I'd be happy to um, connect with them on offline, but I think uh, one thing that I can highlight is we're also launching um, a building lookup tool on our website, and that should be launched uh, sometime this week. And the building lookup tool is, is intended to provide you with as much information as we can on your building uh, to sort of serve as an initial point of contact where you can identify what your building's emissions are, what the potential penalties are, uh, let it grades, and it's really a snapshot of how your building is performing. And then we would recommend uh, contacting an account manager to, uh, to go in, into more detail in terms of um, the support you would. Yeah, just, just to your point about feedbacks, uh, there's a significant portfolio in New York to have feedbacks, whether it's hotels or if it's residences. And there is a technology out there now, there's a couple of them, like two that are really going into the sleeve, dealing with the insulation, you're closing a significant hole in your building that's leaking air in and out. And there are technologies now that are successful out in the market that are rated for the incentive programs. They already passed all of those rules. So that technology does exist. Uh, it's in the market now. And certainly I'd like to talk to you about it, but uh, there's, there's a lot out there right now. That it, the good news is the technology is trying to pace with the need and it's accelerating to use your business uh, pretty rapidly. Right now. That's a follow up to the gentleman's question on the tenant. Maybe it's a too early in the process, but when I talk to people, people are always worried about dollars and cents. Is there any case studies or success stories tied to? the value of that property went up because that building isn't on its path to meet the emission target for the city. Because you can make an argument, I mean, I think intellectually that my building's not paying $268, but you're putting in the effort now, that's going to help my building in the future. But do we have any success stories at this point in time? I know it's early in the program, but something like that would be very helpful with tenants. Yeah, that, that's a great point. We do have case studies, um, but they really speak to uh, the cost savings and uh, you know time and comfort and things of that nature, rather than they would um, you know speak to increasing the value of the building. 
uh, which I think would be hard to quantify. But we realize that there, you know, there are additional benefits beyond uh, the direct cost savings or energy savings. Okay, thank you. Um, and we, the question was um, essentially reading studies or from EPA and Energy Star and ratings, but it's it's difficult to get a good grade in New York City. So what is what is recourse if someone can't meet the cap? Um, I think the grades and those are. I, there are two separate things, the latter grades uh, and the local law 97 emissions. So I think with respect to local law 97 uh, emissions, I think there are different strategies, some of which we've covered, uh, whether it's looking at RECs, if there's uh, you know certain limitations within your building. Uh, but it's really, I think the first step is to try and evaluate your specific building, identify what measures are feasible, and then in addition to that, if, if you still have uh, additional need, then you can look at RECs and other on-site generation and other metrics. But in terms of the lot of grades, I think that's really, um, you know, in terms of energy efficiency, that's, that's really the, the key thing to focus on is finding ways to improve your operations and finding ways to improve the equipment within your building, which would translate to energy savings within your building. So I think I think of them as two separate things um, because you could have, uh, you know, relatively decent letter grade, um, but not not be within uh, the limits of local on eighty seven, whether it's the twenty four uh, limits or the twenty thirty limits. So um, they're, you know, in somewhat uh, some cases very uh, two distinct issues. Uh, but the solution I think would be to connect with the accelerator and identify what um, what you can do specifically to building. I think this microphone like just said. Um, well, okay. I lied. There's one more question that I'm hoping is a, a quick hit. Um, is there any sort of database or search engine that you know somebody would be able to look up the current list of buildings with lower energy grades? Yes, I think the uh, through the Department of Buildings uh, webpage, you can identify. Um, I think you can search in the individual buildings to identify what their letter grades are. Um, but I think in terms of doing research to identify where uh, buildings with low uh, letter grades are, I am not aware of a, res uh, a resource that would point you directly to uh, certain segments within the market that have buildings with low performing. Uh, light degrees. But we are launching the light, uh, building lookup tool, which you can identify what your building's uh, grade is and look up any building uh, and identify what, what their grade is. But it's not sort of, um, you know, synthesizing that information down to specific areas that, that have a high concentration of those buildings. Great. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the Q&A. Oh. Okay. Thank you so much, Simon and Rosie. Thank you for a really robust Q&A session, both in person and online. In a moment, we are going to transition to our smaller breakout sessions for you to connect with our account managers. So again, if you're in person here, if you want to talk to an account manager, you can head to one of those black tables in the back. Um, and if you are online, we are going to um, drop Oh, excuse me, we have small intake forms, so we can just make sure that we have all the correct building information for you. So there should be one on each table. Please make sure you fill that out as you're getting ready to have those conversations with your account managers. Similarly, online, um, we I distributed a link to an intake form at the beginning. We can drop that link in the chat one more time. Um, and if you are interested in attending a virtual breakout session with one of our account managers, you can navigate to the Zoom meeting that is listed on the screen. Um, we will also drop that information into the chat for your ease. We'll 
give us a couple moments. It will take a moment for us to end this Zoom and start that one. Um, and you'll be in a breakout room with an account manager. So with that, um, if you need help, if you can't stick around today for the breakout sessions, um, you can always contact us at any of these, uh, it, through any of these methods online, give us a call, send us an email, whatever works best for you, we're here to help you out. Um, we are really here to help buildings navigate the complexities of compliance, savings, energy efficiency, financing, incentives. That's what we're here to do, and we want to help you. Um, thank you again to everyone who joined us um, and for everyone who made this possible. A really special thank you to Council Member Ressler's office and staff for making this event possible. The staff at the Brooklyn Heights Library for hosting us here today, opening early, making this possible for us. We are so grateful that you created this avenue for us to provide these services to New York City residents. Have a great day, and we'll be transitioning to the breakout sessions in just a moment.